So right now, I'd like to um, invite Laura Hamilton to the stage. In our, in our attempts to be authentic in territorial acknowledgements, I invited Laura to share from her words what a living land acknowledgement might entail and to touch on her journey in approaching this important beginning place with, from, with humility and sincerity. So welcome, Laura. Thanks, Aline. I'm honored to be here. Um, it's such an exciting day, and thank you for including me. I woke up to the paralyzing climate science in 2013 when I stopped thinking about global warming and began to understand the climate crisis. My focus was on the future we've created for ourselves. I got active, I began organizing, and I wanted everyone to wake up and act to avoid this catastrophic and violent future we were leaving to, gen to the generations that follow us. At that time, I understood land acknowledgements as a respectful way to begin gatherings. I would say that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We acknowledge that this is um, an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and as a way of honoring the indigenous people who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Over time and through beautiful relationships with some of the original people of this land and through deeply thinking about the root causes of the multiple crises we're facing, I began to see such acknowledgements as an opportunity to invite others to think about what we have done and to reflect on the systems and structures that have caused the injustice that surrounds us as, um, and that we continue to benefit from at the expense of others. I learned about the treaties and the promises that were broken or sorry, that were made and broken. And I realized that we are living on stolen land. And I would say that land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context, that colonialism is a current and ongoing process, and that we need to be mindful, or we need to build our mindfulness of our present, participa our present participation. I would say that we are on stolen land. And I would say that the climate crisis is a crisis whose symptoms are ecological, but whose root causes lie in an economy ill-structured and ill-equipped to respect land, labor, and human dignity. And as I spend more time with the knowledge keepers, the Medeowins, the storytellers, and the water walkers, and more time on the land and with the water, understanding my life in relation to all life on earth and to the water that sustains us, I've come to appreciate that climate change isn't a technological problem or an economic problem. It is at its core a relationship problem resulting from a breakdown in our relationships with each other and with the land. This is a crisis that can best be addressed through a relational worldview, a worldview characterized by the concept of a circle, interconnectedness, and connection to place, a worldview based on respect, reciprocity, responsibility, and relationships. Now, I ask people to think about the worldview that got us here and the worldview that we will need to get us out of this mess. And I say that I'd like to begin the evening with a statement of gratitude and political acknowledgement of the indigenous caretakers of this land. And now I say that this is the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples who exist in a deep reciprocal relationship, not only with the land and the waterways, but also with the physical and spiritual forces that connect them to this place, their place of creation in an intimate and meaningful way. Now, when I offer a land acknowledgement, I express my gratitude to the land and to all life on earth. And I invite others to learn from, listen humbly to, and take our cues from the first peoples of these lands and what they're telling us to do. Land acknowledgements are an essential and respectful way to begin gatherings. And I've come to understand that they are much more than that. Land acknowledgements are a local place-based response to multiple global crises and an opportunity to help us to begin to heal our relationships with one another and with all life on earth. And now I'd like to introduce my friend Wasikum. Uh, Wasikum is of the Turtle Clan uh, from Saugeen First Nation and Kettle and Stony Point First Nations along the southeastern shores of Lake Huron. He is a ceremonial helper and learner of the sacred Anishinaabeg language. 
Wascombe is an avid volunteer, advocate, and actionist for First Nations-led initiatives, and is also a well-trained chef specializing in indigenous foods. In 2017, Wascombe paddled the Great Lakes alongside the Earth and Water Walk to raise awareness about the state of the Great Lakes and to petition for Great Lakes personhood. He's now presently the lead animator for Nuwijiwak uh, Dodamak, a grassroots initiative that is focused on the reemergence of traditional indigenous governance. Welcome, Wasikum. Ani Bojo. Um, I just want to say thank you, Laura, for that heartfelt and meaningful um, living land acknowledgement as an Indigenous person. It um, touches my heart to uh, hear something that's real and something that's meaningful um, about the relationships of the Aboriginal people. Um, I would like to say Minigishugat Baugat, Minigashep, good morning to everybody. Wasek Hom Genin Dao, Mijikan Dodem. Saging min mawo yak senang don jaba, skabe was scanning dao demak shoyan nebe onje. In my language, I just introduced myself. Um, my name is Wase Komam of the Turtle Clan, as you heard. And um, this morning, I, I rose early, and I went down to the water that's closest to me. And I started my intentions this way because I was asked to come and share a few words with everybody um, to give voice to the water as we come together um, for this moment, this 2020 watershed moment towards a, a water justice future. I wanted to ensure that this connection to the water is made and that we ground ourselves together in this new and exciting way um, online and so um, I just wanted to start off by acknowledging the water in each and every one of you, the water within myself, and to call forward the waters that give you life, the waters, your home waters, where you come from, the basis of which you do your work from, those lakes, rivers, streams, tributaries, estuaries, all of those bodies of water I wanted to, I want to call forward and center the water here and now in this way. So each and every person that's here listening, I just ask you to take a moment in your heart to think about the water that you come from and to thank that water and thank that water within yourself. We're part of one great system the Great Lakes and, and even beyond. And as someone who paddled this, this water and has been, ha, has been cultivating an active relationship for the last couple of years, you know, we see the waters within the people today and we see the waters all around us and there's a great deal of trouble. And as Laura so eloquently put, you know, we, we have to, figure out how we're gonna get ourselves out of this mess. And it starts by acknowledging the water within, within ourselves and the personal relationship that we cultivate to the waters that, we're, that feed us, that give us life, that give us the very ability to be here uh, in this way together right now. And so my late mother used to always say, the, wa the, wa the water unites us all. And more and more, I'm seeing that that how true that teaching really is. Everybody who's here today has a, a love for the water, has a care for the water, has been called in some way by the water to show up. If we close our eyes right now and we look across the Great Lakes and well over all over Turtle Island, the story is very similar. There is direct and imminent danger and threat and you know, we're all being called to show up. And so part of this moment is to think about the ways in which our relatives who, you know, have those waters right now within themselves that are disconnected from this land, disconnected from this place called Turtle Island, 
How can we include them? How can we reach to their hearts and the water within them to, to call them closer, to call them in to this water justice future that we're, that we're looking at? And so with this tobacco I have in my hand here and the water that's sitting here, I, I um, just offer my heart and I offer my prayers for everybody today. And I'll be going back down to the water in, in a short period of time just to um, to bring to bring that back to the water to say thank you, to say we respect you, we love you. And it's that relationship that that we cultivate that's gonna change, it's gonna change the world. And it already is. So I just wanted to say thank you for being a part of a part of that and um, opening up your hearts, opening up your minds to um, begin to understand the ways in which the water is calling us. And so with that, I would like to um, ask that Arlene comes back on and she has a few more things to share. And um, you'll be hearing from us later today. So I hope uh, I get to uh, interact with all of you later. Aha, chimiguech. Hello. Okay. Ah, oh, thank you, Masekem, for for grounding us uh, so beautifully in in the real reason why we are why we are even here today. Thank you for your beautiful words, Jimmy Quetch. And welcome, everyone. My name is Arlene Slocum, and I come from the waters of my mother, Justina Dales who comes from the waters of her mother, Grace O'Malley, who comes from the waters of her mother before her, Margaret Moyer, and on and on and on, back to the original waters, those of our first mother, the earth. I am blessed to be a mother myself and have two beautiful daughters who have issued forth from my waters. And perhaps one day they too may have children from their waters and on and on and on in a never ending continuum of life. We all come from waters. I sit here now in my home um, beside the beautiful Aramosa River here in the Dish With One Spoon territory, which bound the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee people to share territory and protect these lands and waters here in the treaty lands of the Mississauga of the Credit. I welcome each of you here today and invite you to make use of the chat box to introduce yourselves and share the waters from which you come and the waters that currently support your life. And if you are able, share the traditional lands of the places you call now, now call home. So you can go ahead and, and pop that into the chat. We'd love to see and welcome to each one of you from everywhere that you're joining us. I am of settler descendants from a wide array of ancestry, with many relatives coming from the British Isles and many others through my Caribbean ancestors with a mix of lineages from Africa, India, China, and France. I acknowledge that as a white settler woman, I have and continue to benefit from the harm, genocide, and theft of land that has brought me now to this place that I call home. I consider my ancestors and the impacts they've had, both destructive and life supporting. And I call on them to join me here today in this important conversation of towards a water justice agenda. I'm curious also of your ancestry for all of those joining us. Please also feel free to share in the chat where your ancestors are from and the waters that nourish them in those places of origin. Early this morning, I too went down to the Aramasa River to my waters close by my home and collected some water from the Aramosa. I have it here with me. And I'll have, have it here with me for the course of this day. Um, we invited any of you who are joining to, to have done the same. And if you did, We'd also love to hear about the water that you collected. Please also feel free to use the chat and to, and to type in if you have brought 
um, waters. And I'm just going to take a, a little moment to, oh, I'm hearing some comments in there. It's lovely to hear from some of you. And continue to share, continue to share in this chat as we do this work together. It's really wonderful to hear who's all on the call and to keep in mind the whole day, the waters that are nourishing us. When I consider my own ancestors and reflect on this work of caring for the waters, I can't help but think forward to the kind of ancestor I want to be and the responsibility and opportunity I have to shift the dominant narrative and the culture of water advocacy. I am so grateful to all of you for joining us here today in this work. I believe you are here too because you care deeply about the protection of water. So you are welcome here. We have a really full agenda for the day and I hope it will nourish us and the work that we aspire to. And uh, to take a, a look at, at some of this agenda, I'm gonna welcome my friend and colleague, Mike Bach will forward to join us here on the stage um, to just give us a little bit of an idea of what's entailed for the day. Thank you, Arlene. My name is Mike Balfwell, and I work as the campaign director with the Wellington Water Watchers. And I'm uh, very happy to be here today. I'm very pleased to welcome you all. I'm going to introduce the agenda for the day, and in doing that, I'm going to give a little bit of background. Um, today is the last event in phase one of the People's Water Campaign and the beginning of phase two. The People's Water Campaign has three goals. The first is to define the short-term water protection priorities for the Ontario government now and for the provincial election scheduled in 2022, and also for the municipal election scheduled the following fall. In addition to those short-term priorities, to define a long-term agenda towards water justice that goes beyond the current regulation and the current ways of governing and making decisions about water. And third, to organize a coordinated campaign that will help mobilize public support in the next two years to demand the Ontario government and municipal governments implement these priorities to increase water protection in the short term and work towards water justice in the long term. And you'll see on the uh, information page a background paper that we wrote last April to set up, uh, prepare us all for this campaign. <clears throat> we began planning the People's Water Campaign in January of this year. We were very concerned at the time about very specific issues, permits to take water for bottling and aggregate extraction as those are the grassroots groups we work with the most. The moratorium on new permits to take water for bottling has just been extended, or is on the verge of being extended. We expect it to be extended until April. Um, and the, in January, changes to the Aggregate Resources Act were being contemplated. But there had already been a round of cuts to important environmental protections by the Ford government, and we were concerned there'd be more. Doug Ford says his government will be a government for the people. So we think a people's water campaign is a way to bring together an agenda for water protection that has popular support and makes it clear that the people want water and the environment to be protected. We believe significant political pressure must be mobilized as political will originates with the people, not with government. Now, as we begin this campaign, we're aware that making any claims to represent the people, quote unquote, is tricky. Who are the people claim Ford claims to govern for? And who are the people this water campaign claims to represent? We decided we would initiate this with the best intentions to be participatory and inclusive, and that it will take time to be representative of all the communities and interests. We think of today as the first annual convention of the People's Water Campaign. Next year's convention will be Saturday, September 25th, 2021. You can put it in your calendar now. In March, we were in the middle of organizing visits to communities around Ontario as part of the campaign when the COVID-19 pandemic arrived. We, like many other people, had to change our plan and were no longer able to physically visit communities. So we did several other things. 
we surveyed a diverse sample of 28 organizations involved in water protection issues. We organized several webinars on a range of water issues. And for today, we've organized 12 workshops, which focus on different aspects of water protection, led by grassroots groups in some instances and by leading national environmental organizations and others. And importantly, we convened an advisory group to draft a statement on water justice. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Since March, there have been several developments that we feel add even more urgency to the need to protect water, the need to highlight the intersection of water and justice, and the need for a coordinated campaign for these among organizations and communities who support water protection. First, the Ford government continues to reduce environmental protections and to approve projects, for example, housing developments, highways, aggregate extraction, that destroy the environment and threaten water quality and water security. Second, the resurgent movements demanding racial justice reinforce how white supremacy and colonialism shape who has water security now and who may or may not have it in the future. Third, a humanitarian crisis is unfolding now from climate change. It's not on some distant horizon. Although the immediate impacts may not be dramatic in Ontario yet, forest fires on the US West Coast and in Brazil, melting polar caps, flooding in Bangladesh and India, just to name a few, displace people, destroy habitat, and threaten the water security of whole communities. Finally, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed several things. Governments can act with urgency and make science-informed decisions in the interest of public health when they're moved to do that. People can act in solidarity when there's clear direction and can organize and provide mutual aid. It's clear that some populations are more vulnerable and more exposed to risk, for example, long-term care residents, frontline workers, from healthcare to retail sectors, migrant farm workers, members of indigenous and racialized communities. These are examples of the same populations who are more vulnerable to climate change and water insecurity. There was and continues to be insufficient planning and support for these more vulnerable communities. As impactful as the pandemic is in changing how we live and work, Climate change will impose and require even greater changes and require more government action and more social solidarity. Meanwhile, the Ontario government fails to acknowledge the climate crisis, continues to approve sprawl, cut environmental protections, both of which have great consequences for water security. All of this I've just described is the background to today's agenda. Watershed 2020, as I mentioned, is the end of phase one and the beginning of the next phase. In a few moments, we're going to switch to a different uh, aspect of this uh, software. And Tamana Kohi of the Wellington Water Watcher Board of Directors will introduce a statement that we call Invitation Towards a Water Justice Agenda for Ontario. This is a statement drafted by an advisory committee with people with diverse backgrounds. Um, and there's a link to that it's available on uh, the Watershed 2020 information page. And when we go to the next session, we'll be put in the chat box for you. Uh, after Tamara introduces that statement, Dr. Kelsey Leonard will make a presentation to set the context for this discussion. She'll talk about many things, including water as life and its legal rights.